All right. Welcome, welcome to another IAEI News Live. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich. Today is a recorded session. What I want to do today is I want to talk about some of the questions that have come in. I was um, looking through the <clears throat> I was looking through the YouTube channel, which, by the way, is going great. I want to thank everybody out there. We are doing awesome on IAEI News Live. We have over 2,000 followers now. We're up to 2064. This is great news. Keep up the great work. Hopefully, we're getting something out of the content on the YouTube channel. I'm working hard to try to bring that to you. But we achieved uh, over 2,000 um, new followers to our channel. That is great news. And, and the new followers per the new followers per month are up to over 120 subscribers every month every 28 days actually. So that's great news. And I really appreciate everybody hitting that thumbs up, hitting the bell, following. That's good. So thanks for all you do. So, but today's session, again, it's a recorded session. I am traveling at the time of this event. I am probably in an airplane. So um, I wanted to make sure that we don't miss a Tech Tuesday with IAI News Live. So, today's topic, we're going to do some answering of questions that came in online. And it all starts now. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the questions that have come in. Now, the first one is from Muhammad Mahdi, 8972. Muhammad says, can the ground fault protection of equipment, and I think it means be replaced, be replaced with the short circuit protection of equipment in other words, the ground fault relay measuring the ground current, that's that zero sequence relay in the ground conductor. Can it be replaced with an overcurrent relay measuring the overcurrent in the ungrounded conductors? As the ground fault protection threshold is always high in which the fault current can be considered a short circuit current. Okay, I have to. Re I ha when I first read this, I had to read it a couple times to really comprehend what he was saying in this question. And I'll tell you, I think this is a very good question. So Muhammad says. Can the ground fault protection of equipment be replaced with short circuit protection? Meaning what he's talking about is if I have a, if I have a circuit breaker and the ground fault current in that equipment is greater than Say I have a, a 1200 amp circuit breaker and I, and, my, and I calculate my ground fault current to be, twenty seven thousand amps, and I know that that twenty seven thousand amps is going to clear that by, is going to be cleared by that breaker, even though it's in one phase because it's a ground fault, very fast. I still have to put ground fault protection of equipment on that circuit. And I, I, I think his question is why? 
Ground fault. Can the ground fault protection of equipment be replaced with the short circuit protection of that equipment? <laughs> this is a good question. Now, if I'm looking at 23095 and the GFPE requirements there, here, here, here's how here's my journey. Here's where I'm going to, here's how I'm going to answer this. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to NFPA link and I'm going to go to Article 100 and look at what the definition of GFPE is, ground fault protection of equipment. Because here's my point. Here's my thought process. If he's asking, can I replace ground fault protection of equipment with, with a phase over current device, say a circuit breaker or a fuse, is that permitted? And I think the answer to that has to lie in the definition and in the requirements. Does that make sense? So what we'll need to do is, is take a look at NFPA link and look for the defined term ground fault protection of equipment. So let me do that. There's ground fault detector, there's ground fault path, ground fault grounded functionality, ground fault protection of equipment. There it is. Okay, so the Definition says the following, a system intended to provide protection of equipment from damaging line to ground fault currents by operating to cause a disconnecting means to open all ungrounded conductors of the faulted circuit. So if I just read that, and if I know my ground fault current for that equipment is 30,000 amps and I have a 400 amp breaker, I'm going to open on ground fault current because if it goes through one phase, remember on a three pole, say a three phase breaker, <laughs> I need, if, if the current exceeds the, the pickup points and the instantaneous range or whatever of one of those three, they're all going to open. A system intended to provide protection of equipment from damaging line to ground fault currents by operating to cause a disconnecting means to open all ungrounded conductors of the faulted circuit. All of the ungrounded conductors of the faulted circuit. So now I could probably get away with that on a breaker, but a fuse, if I have a ground fault on one phase, I'm only going to open the one phase. So I would say a fuse probably would not meet that criteria unless there was something in there to open all three fuses, right? This protection is provided at current levels less than those required to protect conductors from the damage through the operation of a supply circuit over current device. Now, this says this protection is provided at current levels less than those required to protect conductors from damage. Now, the next question you have to ask is, what is a conductor? Now, when I hear conductor, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of a cable, right? Oh, I'm thinking of something like this. Okay, this this is a conductor. But let's go see if is there a definition of the term conductor. I don't believe there is, but let's go G. Let's go see. Conductor, conductor, conductor. I've got converter, controller, connector, conduit, conductor. So we have insulated conductor, we have a covered conductor, we have a bare copper clad aluminum, we have a copper clad aluminum conductor, we have a bare conductor. So, well, let's take a look at what the definition of a bare conductor is. A conductor having no covering or electrical insulation whatsoever. We don't have a definition of just the word conductor. Let's see if there's a definition of a word bus. There's no definition of the word bus. So let's go to Merriam-Webster and look at what does Merriam-Webster define a conductor to be. Merriam-Webster says, one that conducts such as material or object 
that permits an electric current to flow easily. Well, that, and, and, and it says copper wire is a good conductor. So, material or object. Bus in, inside of a panel board could be the material or object. So it doesn't have to be a wire. A conductor does not have to be a wire based upon this definition. Now, if somebody on a code panel said, I disagree with that, well, we're going to need a public input and we're going to need a definition of the term conductor. If you just wanted the term conductor to apply to, say, a wire, okay, then you're going to have to figure out what is the definition of the bus that's inside of a panel board. Okay, but we're going to leave that the way it is. So, so, and remember, this is my opinion on this. I'm, I'm, I'm just explaining my thought process. And everything that I'm explaining here means absolutely nothing. Do you know who matters? The authority having jurisdiction. The electrical inspector. That's who's going to matter in their opinion on this topic. But in my opinion... We don't have a defin definition of the word conductor. We have bare conductor, which we know has no covering or insulation whatsoever. And Merriam-Webster tell us, tells us that a conductor can be anything that permits an electric current to flow easily. All right. So having said all that, we're back to the definition of ground fault protection of equipment which says a system intended to provide protection of equipment from damaging line to ground fault currents by operating to cause a disconnecting means to open all ungrounded conductors of faulted circuits. It says this protection is provided at current levels less than those required to protect conductors from damage. Now, if I have 1200 amps say being the main to a panel board. When I use the term ground fault protection of equipment, I'm providing protection less than 1200 amps for it to be ground fault protection of equipment. That's the way I read this. If I have 1200 amps as a feeder protection device at the beginning of a feeder, which is say is a conductor, then, and it's 1200 amps worth of conductor, my protection would have to be less than 1200 amps. So to answer this question, this thought process, I'm at a no at this point, because when it's, if the language in the code says, you shall have ground fault protection of equipment, that tells me that the protection must be provided at current levels less than those <clears throat> less than those required to protect conductors. So if your ground fault current is 150,000 amps and you're on a 1200 amp breaker, your you would still need to provide protection less than 1200 amps because of this definition. Else it's not ground fault protection of equipment. Now, let's go take a look at Article 230, 23095, because I'm here, I'm thinking there is, I'm, I'm having a, a, like an argument in my head here. 23095 says, now remember, 23095 is ground fault protection of equipment, and it, and it says that you must have ground fault protection of equipment shall be provided for solidly grounded why electric services of more than 150 volts to ground, but not exceeding <clears throat> 1,000 volts phase to phase for each service disconnect rated 1,000 amps or more. So if I have to have ground fault protection of equipment for a service disconnect rated 1,000 amps or more, if my service disconnect is 1,000 amps, my ground fault protection of equipment can't equal 1,000 amps or be greater because by the definition, it has to be providing protection at less than the rating of a bus or conductor. It gets even more, it gets even more hairy here. Think about that. It says 
the protection provided at current levels less than those required to protect conductors from damage. So that would be your overcurrent, your heating. This is a really good question. Mohammed, this is a very good question. This protection is provided at current levels less than those required to provide to protect conductors from damage through the operation of a supply circuit overcurrent device. So that means so that means that means that so the protection is provided at current levels less than those required to to protect conductors. So if my conductor is a 1200 amps worth of conductor and I have a 1200 amp circuit breaker, then that would tell me that my setting would have to be less than, less than the setting that would be providing protection of conductors from damage. This protection is provided at current levels less than those required to protect conductors. So I'm going less than the conductor rating because a, a, a conductor is going to be damaged. If I have a thousand, if I have 1200 amps worth of conductor, I have to have current greater than 1200 amps for me, for, to, for that current to, pro, to pro possibly damage that conductor, either from an overheating due to a long duration, or if it's very high current, then it would be a short circuit type. So it says, protection provided at current levels less than those required to protect conductors. So 1200 amps, so you have to provide protection less than, say if it's 1200 amp conductor, you have to provide protection less than 1200 amps. So I think that, that makes it clear, Muhammad, that you can't use an overcurrent protective device with the, I think, purely engineering logic that if my fault current is 15,000 amps, and that's in the instantaneous region of the overcurrent protective device, and it's going to open instantaneously, it doesn't matter. Because I, I still have to provide protection at less than the pickup. Now, here's why. Now it's coming together in my head. Here is why. When did ground fault protection of equipment go into the code? It was 1971. And I'll tell you, the reason it went in was because of arc flash events on at service entrance equipment. When they made the change in the design principles, remember most of the systems that we had out there were ungrounded Delta Delta systems. The first ground fault was a gimme. So the change, the strategic change that occurred inside of power systems was they, they grounded the systems. They realized they needed that stability. That's the first change. The second change is they went from 208 volt systems to 480 volt systems. The third change was they went from an average, and this was, I think, the critical change. When they went up in that voltage, they realized they needed larger services. So they went from a, a, an average of a 600 amp service to like 2,500 or 3,000 amp services. The service sizes went larger. And whenever you put these large overcurrent protective devices up there at the main in that equipment, the instantaneous moves way over to the right. The arcing currents are not in the instantaneous region. I'm not talking ground fault currents. I'm not talking three-phase bolted fault currents. I'm talking arcing currents. There was a gentleman by the name of Dunkey Jacobs who realized that when there is a ground fault in service equipment, it goes three-phase within two cycles. Okay, one cycle is 0.016 seconds. Two cycles is 0.032 seconds. That is pretty doggone fast because you get this plasma cloud that goes around all three phases and now you've got a phase to phase to phase, three phase arcing fault, which is less, which can be even less than the rating of the equipment. 
because of all the impedance of the current going through the air. And it wasn't tripping these devices. So they wanted a faster acting device. And in 1971, we didn't have microprocessors like we have today. We didn't have cell phones back in 1971. The technology that we had at the time was ground fault protection of equipment. And it was in a relay, separate device that would shunt trip the breaker. And it had CTs. That is when this went in. So they wrote the language to make sure that they would get those low arcing currents. So Muhammad, in my opinion, in my opinion, because of the way the definition is, now, in 2.30, we were going to 2.30. In the setting, it says the ground fault protection system shall operate to cause the service disconnect to open all ungrounded conductors of the faulted circuit. The maximum setting of the ground fault protection shall be 1,200 amps. And the maximum time delay shall be one second for ground fault currents equal to or greater than 3,000 amps. And that's a maximum number of one second. So you can go faster. But my issue here is if I have a 1,000 amp circuit breaker, this is telling me I can set the ground fault protection of equipment up to 1,200 amps. It says... The maximum setting is 1,200 amps. So, but if I have a 1,000 amp circuit breaker and 1,000 amps worth of equipment, and I set my ground fault protection of equipment up to 1,200 amps, it doesn't meet the definition of GFPE. It has to be set less than 1,000 amps. I can't put ground fault protection of equipment at 1,000 amps either if the equipment is rated at 1,000 amps. Now, if I put a 1,000 amp main inside of equipment that's rated for 1200 amps, then I could put GFPE at a thousand at a amps because remember the defined term says the equipment or conductor, the conductor, which we said because of the definitions, that's the bus inside of the switchboard or panel board or whatever it is. So if I have a thousand amp breaker, but my bus is rated 1200 amps, then I could set my GFPE at 1000 amps because it's still less than the rating of the conductor. But if my conductor, my bus is rated 1000 amps and I have a 1000 amp breaker there, then my ground fault protection of equipment can't equal 1000 amps or greater. It has to be less than 1000 amps, else it doesn't meet the defined term for ground fault protection of equipment. Now, and it has to open all three phases. So, is there a requirement for ground fault protection of equipment to be listed? I'm not seeing it in 230. Let's look in 240. F L I S T. I'm just doing a search. Okay, so 240.7 says, ah, uh, 240.7 says, the following shall be listed branch circuit overcurrent protective devices, relays, and circuit breakers providing ground fault protection of equipment. All right, so now, Muhammad, your fate is sealed, my friend. If I have a requirement in the code that says you shall provide ground fault protection of equipment, 240.7 tells me specifically that the ground fault protection of equipment, whether it be the breaker or a relay, whatever it is that's providing that functionality, has to be listed. And in that case, based upon the defined term for ground fault protection of equipment, 
You can't simply say that a UL489 device provides the ground fault protection of equipment. The overcurrent protective device cannot meet the requirement. And I wonder how they handle it in 430. Because I thought in 430, it said ground fault protection of equipment had to be provided for motors. Motor controllers, motor control centers. I'm looking for, um, looking for protection of live parts. That's over a thousand volts. Adjustable speed drive systems. I'm going backwards in the part. There's the motor control centers, motor controllers, motor control circuits. Motor control circuits. I'm not seeing it there. I thought it was in the hundreds. Could have swore there was. Let's look in the adjustable speed drive systems. Branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault, 430.130. Now this is in part 10, adjustable speed drive systems. So it says here, circuits containing power conversion equipment shall be protected by a branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protective device. In, okay, in accordance with the following, the rating and type of protection shall be determined by 430, where the maximum branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protective ratings are stipulated for specific device types, the manufacturer's instructions for the power conversion equipment are otherwise marked. A self-protected combination motor controller shall be permitted uh, where specifically, where an instantaneous trip circuit breaker or semiconductor fuses are permitted in accordance with the drive manufacturer's instructions for use as the branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protective device. Now, it doesn't say ground fault protection of equipment. It just says ground fault protection. So because it doesn't say ground fault protection of equipment, I would say you're not into the term that we just used. So I'm in 430, so let's take a look. I could have swore there was a, a, another area here too. Let me just do article 430 and search. I'm using uh, NFPA link right now, ground fault in 430. Ground fault is a fault between the ungrounded conductor, 430.51. These are general requirements. Overload relays. Oh, some overload devices are marked with a maximum short circuit and ground fault protective device rating or setting. So, in a motor circuit, it doesn't say ground fault protection of equipment. It just says ground fault protective device. So like in 430.40, 430.40 says, now this is in 430.40 is actually in part two, part three, motor and branch circuit overload protection. Overload relays and other devices for motor overload protection that are not capable of opening short circuits or ground faults shall be protected by fuses or circuit breakers with ratings or settings in accordance with 430.52 or by motor short circuit protector in accordance with 430.52. Let's look at 430.52. 430.52, rating or setting for individual motor circuit. The motor branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protective device shall comply with 430.52B and, so it has to be B, the motor branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protective device shall be, be capable of carrying the starting current of the motor. And then it says uh, in, in A, and either 430.52C or D as applicable. And C is rating or setting. 
a protective device that has a rating or setting not exceeding the value calculated according to the table values given in 430.52 Charlie 1 shall be used unless otherwise permitted. So what's the title of 430.52 Charlie 1? The maximum rating or setting of, ma of motor branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protective devices. It doesn't say ground fault protection of equipment, GFPE. <laughs> It just says ground fault protective devices. So they're using the overcurrent devices to provide the ground fault protection. And it's probably a combination of your motor overload and your uh, overcurrent device that's giving you your complete protection for that circuit going to the motor. They give you your few settings, and then you talk about your overload relay table. Oh, wait, so it said, remember, it said or. It said in A, either 430.52 Charlie or D, David. Charlie is the rating or setting. That's the table. And then you have your overload relay table. You have your instantaneous trip circuit breaker. An instantaneous trip breaker shall be permitted if the conditions, uh, and that's your setting. The breaker shall be set in accordance with blah, blah, blah. And then you have your multi-speed motor. And then you have your power electronic devices, et cetera. D or torque motor. So remember, it was C or D. So if you have a torque motor, then you would follow D. Torque motor branch circuit shall be protected at the motor nameplate current rating in accordance with 240.4B as in Bravo. And that is your next higher standard overcurrent device, et cetera. So... In the motor circuits, they are relying on the overcurrent protective device, or I'll say the system, to provide the ground fault protection. And it doesn't specifically call out ground fault protection of equipment. Hence, it doesn't have to be listed as ground fault protection of equipment. <clears throat> it just has to be a, a, an overcurrent device that's going to open based upon the current flowing through it. And they give you the setting. They don't tell you to calculate ground fault protection. In fact, in 23095, 23095 does not say. Here's another little tidbit of information. 23095 only talks about the settings. It tells you where to set the overcurrent, what the maximum setting needs to be. And it tells you you need to performance test it, but nothing in 23095 tells you that it has to operate on ground fault current. It just says you need to install the equipment. So if your ground fault current is less than 1200 amps and you turn it up to 1200 amps, you're following the code, but you've purposely set the device greater than the ground fault current in that equipment. Now, the chances of having ground fault current, you know, less than 1,200 amps, <laughs> and then that defeats the purpose, right? This is a really, you know, Muhammad, I, when I first read this, I thought I didn't understand where you were coming from. Now I think I understand where you're coming from, and I understand your question. If my ground fault currents are very high and I know that my say circuit breaker or fuse is going to open, why can't I use that as my ground fault protection? And you can't. You have to buy this device. And there's nothing in the code that says this device has to operate on ground fault currents. What they did in 24087, let's take a look at 24087. 24087, they made it very clear that when you provide the arc energy reduction, it says if you're going to use the instantaneous trip setting, oh no, no, not even that. No, it's in the parent text. It's in the parent text of A of um, B. One of the following means shall be provided and shall be set to operate at less than the available arcing current. I don't have that in 23095. The GFPE doesn't have to be set at less than the ground fault current value. But I have it over here in 24087. 
I think we need some work on to, on the ground fault protection requirements in the code, probably throughout. But I'm seeing some low hanging fruit. I think, Mohammed, you're making you're making sense from an engineering perspective. I think I think you make sense. But that's just me. All right, and it's my opinion, and it's your opinion, and none of it matters. The only opinion that matters is the AHJ. Now, could you make a run at an AHJ to, to go through this logic? They're going to tell you, look, the code says, if it says ground fault protection of equipment shall be provided, we have a defined term, and in Article 240, you have a listing requirement. They'll listen to you talk. They're going to go, great, is it listed? And the UL standard for ground fault protection of equipment is UL 1053. They're going to say, is it listed to 1053? And if you say no, they're going to say, well, it's required to be listed. Ground fault protection of equipment. <laughs> As that function, too, right? You can't say, well, it's a listed circuit breaker. The AHJ has the right to say, well, it's not listed as a drum fault protection of equipment, which is the requirement. Wow. You see how, I don't know, tell me if I'm, if my journey through the code was wrong, but that's my logic. The first place I went was to the definition. And then the, in the definition, there were terms we needed to understand that weren't clearly defined in the code. So we went to Merriam-Webster. Merriam-Webster helped us understand what ground fault protection of equipment is meant to protect. And I would argue that the bus inside of a panel board beats the definition of a conductor. It doesn't have to be a wire. And then we said in Article 240, we looked for a listing requirement. It wasn't in 230 where the installation requirements were found for, say, ground fault protection of equipment on services. It was in 240 where we have the listing requirement for ground fault protection of equipment. And then we went to 430 because we knew, at least I knew, there were ground fault protection requirements in 430 that I don't believe we get covered by using GFPE protective devices there. But if you look over there, they don't say ground fault protection of equipment. They just say ground fault protection, and they give you the methods to provide that protection, and nowhere in there do we have listed GFPE. You're not required to. Even when it's on the secondary of a drive, it doesn't have to be listed to UL 1053 to say it's providing ground fault protection of equipment because the code doesn't require ground fault protection of equipment. It just requires ground fault protection. Make sense? So I would say, Muhammad, over on motors, you can get away with what you're saying. But where it is GFPE required, you can't. But great Great question, great little journey down through the code in multiple sections. All right, the next one, roommate 625. We have suggestion one, leave the code book as is. It's code. Two, update the handbook blue sections with the breadcrumbs example. Uh, and the example he's given, the blue clarification, the blue Clarification language for 450 transformer protection would direct people to sections regarding conductor protection and panel board protection. Okay, so here's what he's talking about. I did a session on transformers, and one of the most common things that I see missed is they don't put a, they'll go, they'll come off of a transformer, say a delta Y ground transformer, and they'll feed a panel board that is a main lug only panel board. Okay, that's what I've seen, I see this all the time. <clears throat> now, um, my, my, so now my, that violates the code and I'll tell you why. In article 408, <clears throat> Article 408, which is on panel boards, and I just want to make sure my numbers, for some reason, I always get 408 and 406 mixed up. Yes, okay. Well, that's because they're back-to-back, -back, right? So 406 is your receptacles, cord connectors, and attachment plugs. 408 is panel boards. I know how to remember that. 
six is less than eight, so and and uh, receptacles are smaller than switchboards and switchgears. So 406 is receptacles, and 408 switchboards and switchgear. I'll remember that forever now. Now 408, I believe it's 408.4. Nope, it's not 408.4. It is the overcurrent protection for panel boards, 408.36. Now what 408.36b says, supplied through a transformer. Where a panel board is supplied through a transformer, the overcurrent protection required by 408.36 shall be located on the secondary side of the transformer. So I, now there is an exception that puts you back to 240.21 Charlie 1, which are your tap rules, right? And your transformer secondary, uh, protect, your transformer secondary conductor rules in article 240, looking at the conductor. And, and what 240.21 Charlie 1 will tell you is if it's a delta-delta transformer, you could possibly protect the secondary conductors by the primary overcurrent device. If it is a single-phase transformer, the same thing. But you have to make sure that the ratings are correct, all that jazz. But I have a delta-Y ground transformer. So I can't follow the rules in 240.21 Charlie 1 because it's not a delta-delta and it's not single-phase. I have a three-phase Delta Y ground transformer. So where a panel board is supplied through a transformer, the overcurrent protection required by 408.36 shall be located on the secondary side of the transformer. I can't get away from that. That's in 408. So if I have a panel board being fed from a transformer, I always have to have a main. Or I have to land on a, say, a safety disconnect switch and then go to a main log only panel board, but the safety disconnect switch has to have the overcurrent protection at the rating of the panel board because that's where the protection is going to be provided. It has to be on the secondary. And that is missed a lot. So I, I made a comment during my presentation in that video. I said, and I, and I relayed the story, I tried to get a note added to the table in Article 450 for overcurrent protection on the secondary side saying to go look at 240 if it's a panel board and go look at, I'm sorry, 408 for if it's a panel board and go look at Article 240 because Article 240, 240.21 I think it is, 240, 240, 240, 240.21, I'm, I'm going off the top of my head, 240.21 location and circuit. If you look at 240.21, I think it's Charlie, transformer secondary conductors, they'll tell you that you can't provide protection of those conductors by the primary overcurrent device. So you have a set of transformer, you have a set of conductors, and the rules, if it's a delta Y ground transformer, you can't go more than 10 feet. You're gonna have to land on an overcurrent protective device. So you have the 10 foot rule. You have the outside secondary conductors. You have a 25-foot rule. You have a 10-foot rule. So you've got to follow the rules in Article 240 for protection of the conductor, and then the rules in 408 for protection of the panel board. You, you got, you, we lose sight of the fact that Article 450 only applies to the transformer. So anyway, that was what I was saying, and I wanted to put it in code language, and it looks like roommate 625 you're saying, hey, leave the, don't touch the code, just put it in the handbook. And, and, and uh, so let's take a look at, let's take a look at NFPA link. What does NFPA link say in 450? Because that's another place. Remember, you have the handbook, but also there is blue text, which is not enforceable. There's blue text in Article 450 as well, or um, NFPA link. Now, if I go to NFPA link, it says the ratings or settings of the overcurrent device obtained are based upon the transformer rating, blah, 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 blah. Transformers must be protected. Okay. Next is transformer with currents in nine amps or more. All right. For overcurrent protection of motor control circuit transformers. 
So I don't see anything in NFP. I thought I, I thought there was something in NFPA link that pointed you back to Article 240. 450.3, that's A. Overcurrent protection shall be required. Oh, I'm looking in. No, I'm, I'm looking in the right one. So I'm not seeing a reference back in 450. Could have swore there was, but I guess there isn't. So my issue with my issue. So here's my here's my uh, some of my concerns. You would have to buy. You would have to buy the handbook to get that information. And in my opinion, I think it should be in the parent text. That's my opinion. Uh, I should have a note in there that just says, hey, don't forget about for now. You could say, look, if you, you're not qualified, if you don't know that you have to follow the rules for panel boards in 408, you're not a qualified person. Oh, I, I get it. I get it. It's a valid argument. But I see mistakes made all the time. I see this missed all the time. And I just think that it needs a little love. Uh, oh, here we go. Look, in the in the blue text of Article 450.3, overcurrent protection, it says the overcurrent protection required by Article, Article 450 may also satisfy the requirements in 240 and in 245 for conductor protection and vice versa, but it is also possible that they do not. So they're giving you that link to 240, at least there. Um a transformer is considered the point of supply and the conductors it supplies must be protected. For applications not more than 1,000 volts, nominal 240.4F permits the secondary circuit conductors from a transformer to be protected by overcurrent devices in the primary circuit conductors only in two special cases. So take a look in NFPA link, the language, the enhanced content in to the parent text of 450.3. That's what I'm talking about, and it's there, so that's a good thing. So if you purchase NFPA Link, you get this explanation. If you buy the handbook, you get that explanation, but if you're just looking at the code book, you don't get that connection to 408 or the reminder to 408 and 240 unless you're following the rules of 90.3 telling you you've got to meet all the requirements. So... I tried. I made a public input and it failed. So I was wrong. And apparently the language, uh, the, the, if you want to understand or if you want to make sure you don't miss certain details, then go get NFPA link or go buy the handbook. So roommate 625, you, uh, the code panel went your way. Leave the code alone. And it looks like NFPA, whoever is the author of the blue text, remember the blue text is not enforceable, but the language they're pointing to in that blue text in the NFPA link, and I haven't checked the handbook. I'm hoping that the handbook has additional information. I'm assuming that if it's in NFPA link, it's probably in the handbook. I don't have a copy of the handbook. So there's information out there and you just need to be aware of it. All right, so good question, roommate 625. All right, Chris F, 3875, how many three-phase 480 to 208 volt 75 kVA transformers fed on the primary side by a three-pole 90 amp breaker, then from the secondary lugs, nothing but three-aught copper straight to the lugs of a 200 amp three-phase main lug panel board I have seen, especially in retail stores, settings, Restyle store settings, most inspectors don't catch it. Chris F. 3875, I agree with you. I have seen it on drawings numerous times. So it's out there. It gets missed every, it gets missed a lot. And that's why I think it should be in the, in the body of the code. 
If you have something you know people are missing because they're missing that link, in my opinion, put it put it in a note in the code book. Man, I love this stuff. All right, David Engelhart says, curious, this YouTube channel remains to identify the acronym IAEI as the International Association of Electrical Inspectors. Also curious why the statement, the Electrical Enforcement Authority remains. Interesting, David. Let's go out where to our YouTube channel. We go to www.youtube.com slash IAEI International. Well, we got international. Well, it is an international organization, so you can't lie with that. And remember, our legal name is still uh, International Association of Electrical Inspectors. We have an operating as uh, legally. Um, so IAEI International is the title. And then it says right in the description, International Association of Electrical Inspectors. I would say it's probably accurate because that is the the legal name of the organization and what we're the independent alliance of the electrical industry is our operating as name, but we should have that up there and we should double check our vision and mission as well. So David, I, I sent an email to Paola uh, asking on this one. So as soon as I read that, I went out to check the website or the YouTube channel and you are absolutely correct. We need to update that language and thank you for your level of detail, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Looking good. Just checking my uh, my recording. All right, let's go to the next one. Pierre 892. Pierre Bellarge at eight or 892 is the first draft available for download. I took a quick look and did not see it online. Thanks, Pierre. All right, so Pierre, here's what uh, I will say. If, if what he's talking about, remember we're in the 2026 code cycle. So we have NEC 2026 being developed. We got done with the first draft meeting in January and I was I did a few sessions talking about the results of the first draft meeting. Now keep in mind that everything I say when I'm talking about 2026 at this point in the process, we we haven't even been balloted yet. So I, the language is not set in stone. There's a high likelihood on some areas, but there's a very high likelihood it will not survive in other areas. So keep in mind that Anything you hear on 2026 code at this point has not been balloted and it's it's just giving you some insight on what is possible. Now, if we go to www.nfpa.org slash 70NEXT, 70 next, and hit enter, and we scroll down the next edition, we see that the first draft report posting date for the general public. Now, if you're, if you're a code making panel member, you have the ability and visibility of where the code is at, at this point. But the first draft report posting date isn't until July 10th of this year. So July 10, 2024 will be the date that the first draft report will be available to look at and you won't be able to download it even when it is posted. Or will you? No, they use NFPA link. So there's no PDF of the first cut to my knowledge. I don't believe so. In fact, you know what we can do is let's go back to, <clears throat> let's go back to the current and prior editions if you go to the current and prior editions and look at the first draft, ar the archived first draft, there's a view button and a second draft, a view button. And that takes you to TerraView. It's not a PDF download. Now let's go to the, uh, say, panel one. We'll go to code making panel one. 
show more first draft meeting minutes. Oh, they do have the first draft ballots you will be able to download. And those will be PDFs and that will show you how everybody voted and any of the comments that were made. So you can download those PDFs, um, <clears throat> but you won't be able to um, download uh, the, the, the main, if you go to the first draft and second draft for the 2023 edition or earlier, it's going to take you to tear of you. Okay, you're not going to get that one big PDF of the, the cut of the first draft. <clears throat> you can go to each code making panel and see what the ballots were for each of the first revisions, but you're not going to see the entire document unless you go to go up to the web page and go into Terra View. And if we go to the next edition tab, it tells us that you're not going to be able to see that until July 10th. 2024. And I would argue July 10th is probably when all of the ballots will be in as well. Second draft public comments are going to start August 28th. So your public comments, you have between July 10th and August 28th to make public comments. So Pierre, thank you for the question. All right, next question is from Pierre again. Source and string have similar definitions, maybe like the EGC serving as grounding and bonding, just saying. All right, let's take a look. If we look at the 2023 edition, where is my NFPA link? There it is. All right, so what he's talking about is the source and string definite defined terms. So if I go to article 100, source and string, where is that at? I'm going to do, I'm going to go to article 100 and I'm going to search for the word string. There's a PV source circuit and a PV string circuit. And then there's a PV DC circuit. So the PV DC circuit is any conductor in PV source circuits, PV string circuits, and PV DC to DC converter circuits. And then there's a PV DC source circuit, which says the PV DC circuit conductors between modules in a PV string circuit and from PV string circuits or DC combiners to DC combiners, electronic power converters, or a DC PV system disconnecting means. And then there's a PVDC string circuit or a PV string circuit. And it says the PV source circuit conductors of one or more series connected PV modules. So I have one conductor that's defined three times. It's a PVDC circuit. It's also a PV source circuit. And it's also a PV string circuit. PV source circuit. So let's do this. I'm going to do a search for PV source circuit, PV source circuit. And I'm going to search all of the code and it's probably going to go to article 690. <laughs> there it is. 690.7. The maximum voltage shall be used. Photovoltaic source circuit. The maximum DC voltage for a PV source circuit shall be calculated in accordance with one of the following. And then it says the sum of the PV module rated open circuit. I'm in I'm in 690.7 alpha. <laughs> PV source circuits. PV source circuit. 690.7. What's the definition of a PV source circuit? The definition of a PV source circuit is it's under the PV DC circuit. So the maximum DC voltage for a PV source circuit, and that's probably going to be the multiple con the multiple panels PV source circuit. Hold on, I'm, I got to click on it. The PV source circuit, the PV DC circuit conductors between modules in a PV string circuit, and from PV string circuits or DC. <clears throat> okay, all right. Let's go 
back to 690.7. You know, sometimes adding all of these defined terms doesn't really help in the clarity. I'm just saying, at least not for me. So 690.7. Okay, A, photovoltaic source circuits. The maximum DC voltage for a PV source circuit shall be calculated in accordance with one of the following methods. The sum of the PV module, so A1 is the sum of the PV module rated open circuit voltage of these series connected modules in the PV string circuit, corrected for the lowest expected ambient temperature. For crystalline and metal and multi-crystalline silicon modules, the sum of the PV module rated open circuit voltage of the series connected modules in the PV string circuit. So they're using the PV string circuit to better clearly define which modules that they're talking about. And you have the PV source circuit, which includes also the PV string. So you could have a conductor that is a PV source circuit and a PV string circuit. All right, so at least we know how they're using the terms. And Pierre, <sighs> I think you're right. It is, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You have more than 12 question marks. So here's my thought process. In my opinion, sometimes adding more defined terms may not provide the clarity. Just looking at the terms, I think you've got to go back to 690 and look at how every one of the terms are being used to see why they did what they did. I'm not saying what they did, what they, what they, I'm not saying what they did was what I would have done. Um, I'm just saying once you look at it in context, you start to understand the clarity they're trying to bring to the table. I don't know if that clarity is achieved, but it, there's no suggested change for the 2026 code cycle. So, what they did in 2023 by adding these terms, nobody seems to have problems with. And maybe it did exactly what the panel four intended it to do. And it added the clarity that they needed. There weren't any comments. So, Pierre, if you uh, are having tra challenges with those terms and you have some better language, please make a public input. All right. Alrighty, I think, Pierre, I am going to stop on that question, everybody. Um, I hope, again, I'm, unfortunately, this is a recorded session. I'm probably in the air while this is being aired. Go figure that. Um, but I wanted to make sure that uh, we hit the topics that are important today and so I recorded this session. We're, what I will start to do is I will look through the, these comments that are made on the YouTube channel, and I will filter the answers to these in to future discussions. So um, for those of you who have made comments and, and I failed to see those, I apologize. I will be looking at those moving forward. Um, I'm not going to just read uh, the general comments that come in, but if there's qu if there are questions in there or like those that we looked at today, I will make sure that I cover my content and we hit a few of those questions. And I know we answer questions live whenever I'm live. So, uh, but I will make a point of it to make sure that we pick up some of these other questions. And I would argue. I'll also be looking at um, maybe doing sessions just like this, which it's all we do are look at comments that have come in online. All right. So hopefully I've answered some of those questions. And, and, and maybe if I did my job very well, I've created some more questions in your head uh, that you are going to post and maybe I've planted some, some seeds that um, I would hope that you go and feel confident enough to make some public inputs to the National Electrical Code. Thanks for joining in this session. Thanks for what you do for the electrical industry. Thanks for what you do for electrical safety. And we will see you next week, same time, same channel. Thanks.